Thank you for joining us at the 10-year anniversary of Expo Chicago, the International Exposition of Contemporary and Modern Art. Leading international collectors and philanthropists continue to significantly impact museums through substantial donations and catalyzing art commissions, reflecting a commitment to the values of public institutions, civic engagements, and global collaboration. Join Madeline Grinstein, Prisker Director of the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, alongside Dimitris Descalopoulos, Neon founder and collector, and Brendan Fernandez, artist, Joffrey Executive Board member, and Chair of the Joffrey Academy for a discussion on creating greater access for contemporary art, how collections can impact contemporary institutions, and the role of collectors and philanthropists in advancing artistic practices. This panel is presented in partnership with the Museum of the Contemporary Art Chicago and Art News. Now please join me in welcoming our panelists. Thank you, Kate. And uh, the first thing is, is this is super un-MCA because we're starting right on time. <laughs> which I find hilarious, right? Uh, anyway, welcome everybody. It is so good to see, first of all, so many MCAers in this room. I'm talking about the fantastic uh, MCA team. I see Renee, Hillary, Bana, JD, Nolan, I just saw Jack, Kristen, everybody's here. So Abe, Laura, welcome. Uh, I also see incredible friends of the MCA on the Board of Trustees. So thank you, Leslie, Carey, Larry, uh, for being here as well. And thank you all for being here, for your interest in the arts, for knowing that we are all part of a very, very important ecosystem here in Chicago uh, that reflects on the larger world. So thank you for believing in artists, and thank you for believing in their work. Um, so why are we, the three of us, together? Um, there is a connection here, and that has to do with the fact that first we begin with artists. So, Brendan Fernandez, thank you for being here. And Brendan has uh, uh, enormous influence in Chicago and beyond, and specifically, we have worked with him at the MCA, and specifically, Dimitris Daskalopoulos' Neon Foundation has commissioned his work. So, why is Dimitris here? Why, what, uh? Uh, because on one, not one connection is that he is an MCA trustee. And then another connection I think you've read about, um, which is a year ago yesterday, on April 13th, Dimitris Daskalopoulos gave his collection away to the Tate, the Museum of Contemporary Art Athens, and jointly to the Guggenheim and the MCA. In an unpre yes. <laughs> in an unprecedented gesture of, uh, of uh, giving away some 300 works, uh, one of the largest donations uh, worldwide and very deliberately globally and universally. So that's why the three of us are here. And we're gonna, we're gonna talk about a few things that, that uh, we together thought um, were threads in both of your works. I'm interviewing you guys, okay. So we're gonna start with the idea of the body. So, um, Brendan, you are going to start, and I've got the clicker. You can tell me to move around. And um, you are an incredible artist here in Chicago, incredible you know, professor, um, choreographer, dancer, sculptor, all the, all the things. Um, why is the body, both your own and others, uh, so central to your work? Um, yeah, thank you first and foremost, but yeah, the body for me is a central part because as a dancer, it's my tool. As, um, as, a, as a cultural worker, it's a way to commu communicate and create gathering. And for me, uh, my work is about creating spaces of intimacy and solidarity through gathering. And so the body is a tool, but it's also a conceptual um, material as well. Dance for me is political, it's protest, but it's also done in a different form. And so I think that even like us being together right now in this space, this is a beautiful gathering. And this is, means like, you know, bodies come together through intimacy, through touch, through caring, which has been complicated in the last couple of years. But for me also, it's this idea of synergy, of understanding each other, breaking down binaries to kind of form a space of inclusivity. And for me, that's what dance means, but that's what it means using the body, because it's a, it's a physicalness, but it's also something that is about a presence and about an, a way of communicating 
a cultural togetherness, which is a way I think about the world socially and politically to kind of reach to that space. Um, this is a big, I, we just saw an outdoor piece that you um, organized for the Millennium Park in Chicago, I believe, yes. and now we're looking at a gorgeous piece that I think found itself fully manifest at the Whitney Biennial, yes. uh, the one before last. Um, can you tell us a little bit about this one in particular? Um, this one in particular looks at the kind of idea of the labor of the body, the dancer as, you know, using their bodies as a tool of, 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 of labor, the body itself is exhausted. I think when we watch dance on stage, we kind of dehumanize the body. We see it as something that just does things. And when you're watching my performances, you're always in close proximity to the body. So you can hear it breathe, you can see it, you sweat, you kind of get this visceralness, you know, this kind of quality that the body is alive, the body is intimate, it's also fragile. And so this piece, you know, um, for the Whitney Biennial, we performed it 150 times, and each time the performance is five hours long. And so the piece is a very long hardship. Um, and so even within that, there's a lot of space of nurture, care. How do I support my dancers? How do I let them make choices in the work that I give them, in the tasks that I give them, so that they have agency? So there's always these moments of like, questioning, it's a collaboration. And I think that's another part of my work with bodies is that we're collaborating, we're having conversations, we're talking to each other, we're making decisions for ourselves. And I think of my work as being queer outside of the space of um, you know, gender and sexuality, but queer in the space of it being inclusive. You can have a space to choose to put your body in that space. Yeah. It's so beautiful. Thank you. Um, this is also gorgeous. I, I, I think I've seen almost everything, and then I saw these slides, and I'm like, I don't know, I don't know this one. It's this, just this, this one just happened in Oslo at the Munch Museum, and it was a questioning of the idea of being visible. How does one's body become invisible is something that I've been thinking about. And as a space of political gesture of protest through dance, I'm always wanting to be seen and heard. But what happens if I I mean, invisible. What happens when I don't have to tell someone something or not trying to be seen? Is that the space when I've hit and found my cultural civil rights? And so this piece was kind of questioning this idea of invisibility. And so the dance itself happens in this glass um, auditorium and the, dan uh, and the audience watches from outside. So kind of like appearing. And so the audience themselves are also being kind of manipulated to kind of move in certain ways to sort of see the dance. Mm. Uh, we will get to how um, you're so responsive to the spaces that you are, that you want to, and also are invited to to have agency in. Um, and Dimitris, um, you, uh, your collection specifically, um, from the very beginning when you first dis, uh, started collecting in 1994, um, you really centered your collection thematically. It's very unusual. Uh, to do this. You centered your collection thematically, first of all, was unusual, and then you centered it thematically on the existential questions of the body, and uh, including the human intellect. Um, what is your focus uh, on the body about, and why are you focused on the body in the collection? I started uh, collecting contemporary art uh, and very quickly found that I, w I was putting together uh, you know, a dialogue around a central theme. And that central theme was uh, my marvel at uh, human existence, at uh, you know, this finite being that despite uh, its limited capacities in terms of the universe, in terms of time, is there and fighting uh, on an individual level on a level of a society and uh, is creating progress. And uh, for me, uh, the body is not its physical manifestation. Mm -hmm. It is the locus of, of the human existence because at least in my view, that's what I see. There is soul, there is spirit, there is brain function but I don't know where they are, and science hasn't explained to us, and religion hasn't, uh, or there are so many views, uh, different views, but what is real is the body that expresses itself in uh, many various ways. That's why I was always looking to put together artworks that mainly talk about this human struggle, because it is a struggle. Human existence is a struggle, thankfully a creative one. 
so how much do you love this panel already? I mean, like, <laughs> wow, that's deep. Now, one of the reasons you're as deep as you are is because you're Greek. <laughs> I mean, you read, you know, the Greeks down to the very, very origins of, um, um, you know, how we perceive um, narrowly. I My think, partner, Irene, says that yes. uh, although um, 85% of the artists in my collection are international from everywhere. My collection is basically Greek in, in this theme of putting the anthropos, you all know the word, the human being in the center of everything. Right, exactly. Um, we are looking, I'm showing you, while, he, while Dimitris and Brendan are talking, I'm showing you works of art that are coming into the MCA Chicago's collection thanks to Dimitris Daskalopoulos' gift, right? And Brendan, you too are an extraordinary maker of visual works of art, not only a beautiful maker of dance and a maker of the conditions for experiences that otherwise wouldn't exist, for which we thank you. That is what an artist does. But you also make these incredibly great works of art. You make sculpture, you make photography, and you make mixed media works. So. Can you tell us about the relationship of dance and movement uh, to these sculptures, which are also very figuratively based, and vice versa? Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, maybe like going back to when I was training as a dancer, I also was doing a BFA in visual arts, and I always said that I was dancing, and then on my breaks I would run and like, you know, do bronze casting. So I've always had this background between an intersection between dance and visual arts and, and now finding a, a synergy that they both kind of are in collaboration, that they are working together. Um, this particular work here is our, our you know, I did a piece at the Guggenheim in 2019 where I was looking at um, this question of how do we find freedom within uh, restraint. And oh, is that, is that these guys? Yes, these guys. Oh, yeah, I can um, see that now. And so I was, with the bronze piece, I started to kind of think about the rope harnesses um, as a kind of a restraint, but how do we then, and restrain not in the kind of, just the, the kind of physical sense, but also in a conceptual sense, when we're in a moment of like precarity, how do we find new solutions, new forms to move and become something else? That's what I call human struggle. Yes. Over the ages. Yeah, for sure. Over the ages. I'll just be over here. <laughs> This is great. Keep going. <laughs> and so in the bronze sculptures, you know, I'm definitely referencing, you know, historic artifact, the kind of ideas of um, the torso, kind of like, you know, like artifacts you'd find in museums. And so I've casted the harnesses in bronze, and then they kind of are displayed in this kind of hanging device. But, you know, the work always starts with movement, right? It always starts within a physical space in a studio, but then I go outside and I make photos or I make... Um, um, objects, like, the, like this photo collage, or, you know, I think a lot about the, the camera, the camera as a choreographic tool. Mm -hmm. um, I dance with my camera um, when I'm making my films, uh, when I'm making photography. I think of it as a gesture, you know, even like the way a, a lens moves, it kind of creates a very specific um, viewpoint. And so I'm really thinking a lot about in my process, like even printmaking in this piece, I move the plate, so there's many runs of, the, of this piece in the, um, in the press, but I move it, so it almost becomes like an animation that the plate just gets rotated and becomes a gesture. So they're unique prints, but there also is a dance to my, my method, or maybe my madness, I'm not sure which one <laughs> you want to say. I also love the way that you're both attracted to artworks that really push the boundaries of pleasure and the, you know, torture and just really, as you say, you're like walking the living edges of human emotion uh, that are psychological and, and uh, as well as cultural. And I think that's a response to like a colonial residue um, that still mm -hmm. exists. You know, I'd say there's, we're not post-colonial because I don't think we're post-colonial. We still are living within these systems. Right. And so... Again, it's that idea of finding freedom within restraint. Right. I want to pivot from the body to the idea of collecting and commissioning. Uh, you have collected, you have been commissioned, and you commissioned. So I want to I want to pivot to that thread of similarity. And I this time I'm going to begin with Dimitris. So Dimitris, for almost 30 years, 
you have um, um, carried with you a sense of responsibility that you have acted out with regard to how to share art with the wider public. And you've done that as a collector, but you've also done that with a foundation called NEON, which has used this, the, the country of Greece and the city of Athens in particular um, to create uh, experiences um, where um, you have married um, site-specific installation commissions to very, very important uh, sites in Greece. And um, they are absolutely amazing. Um, this one is one of my favorites. It's not photographable because if you know Tino Segal's work, he does not permit his work to be photographed. But um, Neon commissioned a work by Tino in the Roman Agora of Athens, for example, in 2014. Uh, and so you can imagine, imagine a Tino Segal performance of people walking around yelling, shouting, and so on in this Roman Agora, uh, which is in itself a place, right, of speaking publicly, right? Yeah, I'll say a few words about it. Please, this work. It, it, thank you. Well, just to put everything in a, in the, the frame, NEON is a foundation that I started in 2013 with a simple goal of exposing the Greek public to the challenges of contemporary art because I believe that people who come close to art who are challenged by contemporary art because as you all know, uh, there is, you know, it is sometimes frightening and people <laughs> try to understand and when they cannot, they feel bad and my foundation, in order to achieve that, had two main uh, premises, uh, founding premises. One is, we will not have our own space. We will not have a Kunsthalle, we're not building a museum. We are going where the artists want to create and where the people want to go or, or discover new places. And the second was, it's not about the collection. So it was not to expose my collection. Over the 10 years, we've done 35 exhibitions. I think I've lent four or five works. Uh, so my collecting uh, at the same time was looking at this, uh, putting works together that create this dialogue and around this central theme. And uh, the exhibitions we did all had this flavor. Uh, commissioning, very important. I think it's, it's mm -hmm. when we're talking about what I admire in the human being is the creativity. Commissioning is, is live creativity. It's relevant to the moment. It's relevant to the place. It's inspiring for the artist. It, it charges the... Uh, the site or the exhibition or creates a, a, a dialogue around the other words, world, works that are already in the exhibition. So we've always tried to go commission. Mm -hmm. I can race through, I mean race, unfortunately, but you know, because he's done such great stuff. Um, this is a gorgeous, gorgeous uh, um, observatory in Athens. Uh, which was in not very good shape. And not only do you commission works that um, in, in places that are chosen by the artist, and in this case, Adrián Villa Rojas from Argentina, but then if the space is in not great ideal shape, you go in and you restore it. Uh, and so, you, and then you leave behind this gift to the, to the people of Athens. So, Adrián uh, planted 40,000 plants on that hill and put in, um, 10, 15 large sculptures on one side of it. And it started there, that's on these, uh, one of the sculptures. That's one. Yeah. And so you have a kind of uh, dedication that is, it's so, so smart because you create the conditions for artists to um, leapfrog in terms of their trajectory, but you also afterwards, the trace is not artistic, the trace is structural, a restoration of the historic, and, and therefore the population that lives in that vicinity benefits, as opposed to the typical biennial where you parachute in and out. Um, another uh, incredible example, Anthony Gormley, you invited him to actually uh, um, install several works 
uh, throughout the island of Delos, which is uninhabited, correct? It's an archaeological site, a very sacred ancient site. Uh, and that's no a building sculpture, on it. that's not a person. And he put up uh, 29 sculptures around the island, and it, it was a, a great experience for everybody who visited. And finally, um, an incredible, um, um, really, uh, um, philanthropy at its best, um, a former uh, tobacco factory, and you invested in its complete renovation and then handed it over to the Hellenic Parliament for their use going forward as a cultural it center. It belongs to them. We went in and we renovated it because it was falling apart on one side of it. On the other, they are using it for uh, the, their publishing. And now the whole uh, city is, is trying to get their hands on that right. space. And I hope I, the politicians don't have their way and the artists <laughs> do. I had to take this picture because I, I had to set the alarm. Tom knows this, how rare this is. I got up at 3 in the morning to see this in real time with, with the announcement in the Hellenic Parliament. And I love this quote where you're said, you know, contemporary art is relevant, inquisitive, and suggestive. This is the speech on the floor of the Greek Parliament. I mean, who doesn't want, right, a Congress that you know, has conversations like this. Um, and then uh, you renovated it, you, in, you installed, commissioned, installed, and acquired for Greece a Glen Ligon installation, and then went on to uh, um, underwrite the first exhibition, Portals, which you very kindly asked me to co-curate with the incredible Elina Kunturi. And now I want to pivot to Brendan, because Brendan, you were invited I wonder why, did I know you? I don't, you were invited uh, to do a commission. So Brendan, for, I have a question for you, which is what does it mean to be commissioned? For example, by NEON, or for example, by the MCA for its common space a few years ago. Yeah, I think you said something about leapfrogging, and I think it gives you the space to kind of think outside of the normal parameters that you, someone would, as an, an artist would think through like for a normal exhibition. I think like working with Neon and Portals, and it started with like, you know, a beautiful opportunity, a way to allow one's own, specifically mine, my, my practice to grow and develop, and I think that was such an important thing. And then to kind of collaborate again, I keep using the word collaboration, but working with the team at NEON or the MCA to kind of see the idea of kind of grow and fruition and cite specificity to these two specific spaces, the commons and this area of NEON uh, or the tobacco factory for Can them. you tell us what you're looking at? Yes, so <clears throat> I was, you know, this, is the, this was my first performance piece, um, you know, post 2020, this was 2021, and I hadn't made anything. And I was just, was, you know, a lot of, spending a lot of time at home thinking about like my work is about intimacy, it's about touch, it's about being together and how do we do this? So this piece is called A Solo Until We Can Dance Again. And this, what you're seeing here is rehearsal footage because it was the first time I've ever made a piece for one dancer, a solo. And so we learned different tasks and choreographies, but um, there was on one of the walls, there was a, it's not up right now, but there, there was a prompt and it said, imagine without fear, what is tomorrow? And when there was no dancers or not, a, there wasn't the dancer on this sort of playground, this kind of like architectural pl playground. Um, you constructed that, that yeah. wasn't there. No. That's so, part of what you constructed. Yes, so that's, I constructed that with an architectural team from Neon and um, cause I'm really interested in, again with the intersection of dance and architecture and the body's position with, with with an architectural space. And so it's a kind of a playground and the audience is invited to respond to the, the prompt and to write on the dance floor. And I think of the dance floor as a space of resistance and, and gathering as well, to write a release. You know, we're going through so much, you know, during this moment to write something to, went to the prompt, imagine without fear what is tomorrow. So eventually the dance floor becomes accumulated with all of people's like responses, their releases. And then the solo dancer will come and read them and use those written releases as a form of interpreting movement. And so that was the, the thing. And we did it for a number of months. And there was this moment where, you know, when the show ended, uh, one of the curators, Irene, was like said to me, like, what if you think what should we do with the space afterwards? And I, she said, you know, we're th I'm, we can't send it back to you. And I was like, um, yeah, I can't <laughs> bring this back to me. But they're like, we don't want to destroy it, but can it become a space for um, the children to come and do workshops on? So I love that it's transformative, that it was a dance, 
part of space for installation through portals, but now it's being used for children's programming. And I just love that. Yeah, and talk about without fear. And let's remember, you know, this is right after COVID and still with us. Dimitris. A couple of other anecdotes here are, are very interesting. Of course, we're running out of time, but I see everybody will stay until dinner. I, I see it. <laughs> okay. Um, so I want to point out, uh, we talked about commissioning and the value of live creativity. Uh, this building is in a very densely populated area, which is out of the center of Athens, never had any art of any sort in that area. And you see there's just a little perimeter outside the building, and, and look what happens. The exhibition that's inside is coming outside. And the people who are around uh, yeah. are being drawn to that. And I thought that was very important in that exhibition. It, it, it charged it very much. And this, this person over there is an Afro-Greek. We have a community of people of African origin in Greece who were born there, who speak Greek, have gone to school there, and it's in a country where everybody is white, 99%, they are having some issues. Yes. 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 Uh, and this person was telling in Irini and thanking that it was the first time that my dancing took some uh, you know, importance, and it's the first time I'm being paid to do what I love. So. Well, that's uh, exactly right. I mean, yes, bravo. Um, you're both right in the sense of both of you are talking about giving visibility to what is sometimes not seen. And you're both talking about how to structurally, not just cosmetically, uplift that visibility. And uh, for, uh, Brendan, you did that also in a commission at the MCA, here are your dancers in our common space, our space of civic engagement, and as well as uh, going down our, you know, going down our stairs. Um, so uh, you've done this in so many, so many beautiful places. Thank you. Um, I'm going to now pivot again, and I'm going to talk about this time with. Uh, I'm going to talk about philanthropy um, uh, for both of you. But I'm going to begin with Dimitris, and Brendan, this one's going to be a little more weighted to Dimitris, <laughs> if that's okay, uh, because um, here's Dimitris in his favorite place. And um, this is one of my favorite quotes around, uh, you don't often run into uh, a philanthropist, a collector, a humanist, uh, a board member, um, who um, has thought about not only how to collect, but its eventual gift uh, to the public. And that is something that is um, all too rare, and I hope uh, comes back with your modeling this behavior. Uh, and in particular, um, I want to race you, because of time, through and just give you a sense of the kind of richness of this gift of 100 works to the MCA Chicago jointly with the Guggenheim. It's among the largest collections of art ever given to the museum by a single donor, and it is firmly grounded in our institutional values, particularly our long-standing commitment to cutting-edge experimentation. Um, the final selection, one of the things, again, that I so admire about Dimitris is that the final selection was done together. You and me, we did it together. You didn't just dump this stuff on us. I mean, you did it, and we did it together because that way we very, very deliberately doubled down on strengths. For example, now we have a concentration of Matthew Barney marrying this to what we already had in place, Mike Kelly's as well. We doubled down on strengths. We merged, um, we merged with, with these and Anna Mandieta, and we also bolstered gaps, Paul Chan and many, uh, Jimmy Durham, many other artists. And what's really exciting exciting about this collection, as I mentioned before, is that it is highly focused on large-scale installations, sculptures, uh, and figurative work. 
from the 1980s and 1990s particularly. And if you guys were here for the previous panel, which you know, made my head explode, so amazing, that is the uh, philosophical and now sort of, um, that is the kind of artistic uh, grounding, I think, uh, chronologically for an emergent generation now of artists, curators, and directors who can really use this as a baseline to continue to evolve a more inclusive and welcoming and revelatory art history. Um, these works are um, uh, truly, truly um, game-changing for us. And um, we also have all-time firsts, thanks to Dimitris's gift. Um, we now have Bob Gober, Sarah Lucas, Gara Amer, Carla Black, Paul Chan, as I said, Paul Pfeiffer, Steve McQueen, uh, Rebecca Warren. It goes, it goes on and on. Um, and so my question, Jimmy's Trees, is... After all these years of building this incredibly, incredibly unique and extraordinary collection, why did you choose to distribute it in the way that you did? Why did you choose this moment? And why did you choose to give it away? It's, it's been there uh, from the start with me. Um, I found some proof. I'll talk about it in a minute. But uh, from the beginning, you know, my collecting was about admiring the artwork and feeling its power. Uh, it was not about collecting names or uh, getting advice from advisors or from galleries. There was no financial back thought in what I was doing. So it was, you know, the artwork and how I felt. And when an artwork talks to you, it's because the artist is in there. And when it talks to you, I believe it talks to somebody else as well, or to many other people. So in that sense, I never felt I could own an artwork, because there's an artist there, there's a message, and there's a set of feelings with other people when they see it and interact with this art. So who am I to say, it's mine and I will keep it. It doesn't have a, a meaning if it's not interacting with a viewer. So that was my, my view from the beginning. I, I always said I'm, I'm the temporary caretaker of the creativity of other people. Mm. I'm not an owner. Beautiful. <laughs> so, you know, this, this outcome came totally naturally to me because uh, where will these works, you know, go through this process of, of constant interaction with people in public museums? Uh, I never believed that a private institution, uh, you know, private institutions uh, do a lot of nice things, and there are a lot of passionate collectors who want to share their own passions in the artworks, but that is finite, I think. When the, the passion of, of the creator goes away, then you're left with an institution that uh, over time disintegrates, whereas public museums are there and will be there forever, and their job is to expose the public to uh, art, and uh, that's why I felt it was totally natural for me to give it away. It's not a good explanation because people keep asking me <laughs> why did you do it and they're waiting for, I don't know, a, a sassy answer. I don't have one. It's, it's deep. <laughs> I think that's a super sassy answer. Uh, speaking of sassy, Brendan, <laughs> can, you, <laughs> can you tell us about the times that a museum collection has catalyzed your work? Yeah, I think you pulled yeah, a leading image. A leading yeah. image um, you know, <laughs> But again, thank you. Those words are so generous and kind because it's so giving in, in from the start of a commission, but also to the way that you then re, re, um, are responsible, but also take care of the artist afterwards as well. I think that's a really important thing to note, and that's huge. Um, and, you know, w working with museum collections, you know, I, I also get this opportunity to kind of come into a space and kind of like get 
access, you know, and I think the Noguchi Museum was a huge thing for me where I was looking at my history with Martha Graham Dance um, and training with the, the Martha Graham Dance Company in Toronto and then finding a way to find, again, collaboration and synergies between Martha Graham, Noguchi, and then myself. And so this exhibition became, you know, three years. My work is process. You know, I kind of, I'm always, that was my canadian process. Um, um, you know, it's like long-term kind of research and then things kind of manifest. And so being allowed into the Noguchi uh, Museum's archive and working with their documents, I started finding these synergies between Martha Graham, Noguchi, and myself. And so I think for me, it's again about this, this, this greater opportunity to kind of develop and grow and challenge the work, but also to take time. And as an artist, I like to take time. I like to like really give myself the space to really kind of let it marinate and understand what this is. Like I had no idea I was going to make a, a collaboration with Martha Graham and Noguchi. You know, like I was like, a, and I call it that because the show itself just became a moment where I felt like the. The museum was my house. Like I would go there and just kind of feel, like, you know, I was part of that community. And also, I, when I look at your gorgeous photographs, too, I feel that um, they're informed by the documentary photographs of Martha Graham, too. Definitely. And again, other museum collections, looking at the Met's mask collections and the ways that many mask objects in, in African collections don't have artists named to them, but all those objects were once danced. And so I'm using the ballet body, the colonial body, as a way to reinstate the body back into these objects. Oh. Thank you for that. that. I hadn't thought of it when I looked at that image. Thank you. That's beautiful. And you're now working on a, a something for the Barnes? Yeah, I think there's some Barnes people here. Yay, Barnes! Um, yeah, I'm working on Was a, I allowed to say that? Yeah, you Okay, can. good. What are July, you doing? July, 13, <laughs> July 14th, um, it's a collaboration with me and William Edmondson, and I'm working on a new dance commission, but I'm also working with the museum's design team to kind of make part of my installation be part of the museum design so that it's going to be part of the Edmonton show, but I'll also have like a moment in that space. So we're actually weaving this large carpet that becomes a performance space, um, but also a space for, you know, audience to, to gather on as well. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you. Okay, last, last question, and I'm, I'm going to land on, um, on this, um, Oh, I thought I had a. I thought I had the landing page from our original. Can you bring up the, you know, our names and everything like that, and the title of this? Um, so, last question, uh, and this is this pivot is the last pivot, and it's about trusteeship, and it's about the future of museums. And I'll begin with Brendan. So, Brendan, you sit on the board of the Joffrey Ballet. And uh, you also, um, during the time that was the last three years, um, you proactively and um, unsolicitedly a kind of stepped in and acted as a kind of good, honest broker between ourselves, the museum, and the artist community during some, you know, really, really hard learnings for the museum. And, and we are very, very grateful for those moments because of where we are today. Um, why is it important for you to act between the artists, the community, and the cultural organization, both at the MCA and at the Joffrey? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think when we think about decolonizing, for me, it's not about dismantling to a point of like, like building a new. For me, it's about, you know, I always say it's about creating new doorways and pass uh, passages within a space. So kind of a metaphor. Uh, so that was a, kind of a more of like an abstract answer. But I'm really thinking a lot about like, how do I inter put my body into that space? How do I give myself visibility and find change from within that system? And so for me, as a, as a former dancer, I want to create change to the narrative of ballet. The things that made me feel like not included, I want to kind of question that and find criticality, but to acknowledge the history, but to also then find space within that. I think that's also something that I'm doing in in with muse museums as well. So for me, it's really about empowering. It's really about like allowing, you know, putting myself there to empower myself, but for others to then find an empowerment agency and questioning their visibility of how they can acknowledge and be part of that, that, that institution as well. So it's work and there's lots of work to be done and the work is not done, so, but you know, I will be someone who wants to make that change and see something moving forward. Again, that language of dance to move forward. Yeah, I, I've in and the artists that I you know deeply love, and I love so many of them. I have seen a shift uh, in their evolution that 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 allows for space not only to make art but also to address 
um, the operational uh, behind the scenes of where they show art. That, that, that really is mattering to them as well. So thank you for that. Thank you. And um, Dimitris, um, you became a trustee at the MCA in 2016 after we had a really good fish lunch at that seaside restaurant in Athens. I'm like, okay, this is the moment. He's feeling great. Uh, and you also have ties to Chicago because you went to Northwestern. Yay. And we love that. He teaches there. And, um, and um, you know, and you're also a board member at the Guggenheim. Um, and um, most interestingly to me is that um, in giving the collection away the way that you did, you very intentionally established a shared museum partnership model of a scale and precedent like no other when you invited the MCA and the Guggenheim to share 100 works of art. No museum has said yes to that. And let me tell you the reason is, is that it's really hard. Museums co-acquire works and co-own works, usually videos that you find on a little chip, but physically owning the, the likes of the scale that you just saw is a wonderful and welcome challenge. So you created a groundbreaking initiative in doing this between renowned museums and on a global scale, because you connected us to the Tate and you connected us to Athens. Why is it important for you to be, uh, to show up uh, on the board of a museum? And why is it important for you to break and make and remake the museum model in these ways? A little sidestep uh, to the 2016 uh, fish dinner, it wasn't, that innocent, and so that I don't take all the credit myself for what I did here, Madeline Greenstein, from that moment on, got into my head, uh, saw what is in there, and guided me <laughs> to the <laughs> to get me to the point of because it's it's a hard decision for a collector, even when you know that you were going to give everything away. Where do you give it, and how do you split it, etc. So. Madeline was uh, a key in that thinking that developed and ended here. I wanted to say that publicly. <laughs> so, uh, you know, collector is, is, is a bad word, I think, uh, especially where I live. Uh, it's somebody who, you know, has made a lot of money, maybe in, you know, questionable ways and spends it uh, buying great things to hang on, his, on their wall and show to their friends. So I never felt a collector. I was an art lover. And when you are an art lover, you know, I started, I say, my... Uh, when I realized I'm an art lover, it was when I was 12 and saw a Rubens painting and froze for two hours. <clears throat> so museums, you go there because that's where the great art is. And uh, when you're a collector, there are three basically domains in the art world. You know, this, the artists, that you can try to talk to them, but you can never get in their head. So it's the domain of the artist's head. <laughs> Difficult to explain. Marvelous. Thank you for, <laughs> for being crazy, like you said. <laughs> then there's a domain of uh, museums, which you know, are preserve and, and expose art. And there's a domain of the art market, where it's the, you know, the galleries, the collectors, or not forget, the bankers, because they have to move the money. <laughs> If you get stuck in just one of the, you have to, if, you, if you're an art lover, you have to be exposed to everything. And uh, I was always curious to see uh, how does a museum work. And, you know, to cut a long story short, by being on the board of these museums and seeing the, the very able and passionate people who are there, who love artists, who love art, who struggle every day to create something beautiful. That is what led me finally to trust this, these public institutions. And uh, sometimes we wonder what is the mandate of a museum in the future. I say, you know, basically there's, there's no future. The mandate of the museum is, is to preserve, to evaluate, to expose the work of artists, to expose them to the public. And I think over the 
over time since this, this institution was invented. It's working just fine. It's finding buildings. Uh, it's being funded more or less, you know, and, and it goes on and people visit and uh, there are always, I, I have found, able people who are sensitive to what's happening in society but never veer off this, this main basic mission of the museum. And that's why I say I will not be here. A foundation that I, I would have created will not be here in 50 years public museums will be. I said somewhere, I'd love to be here in the 22nd century and see how these works that I gave are being put in dialogue with what is, how does art look in the 22nd century? We don't know. Very, very exciting. Um, yes, bravo. There are, yeah. We'll have to ask uh, Bonner, Jadine, and Nolan because they'll still be around. Um, <laughs> Uh, three words that you both share, um, the origins of the word philanthropy are Greek, and it means love of humankind. The origin of the word museum, museon, comes from the place of the muses, the place of gathering and inspiration. And the word curator comes from curare, which means to take care of. And both of you do all those things. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I am looking for Kate because I think we can, I think we have time for a Q&A. And I think there's a mic running around. So if anybody has any questions for Brendan or Dimitris, uh, now is the time. That would be lovely. Um, this question is for Brendan. Um, first of all, thank you all for the talk. Um, I, I actually thought when you were hitting on the point of philanthropy, you might ask Brendan about this project that um, he started sort of during the pandemic, um, which I think is a really kind of exciting model, which is the, and I hate to do this at an art fair, because I always say, I don't want to hear about NFTs at an art fair. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that project. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was wondering, I'm like, which project you're gonna ask me about? Um, yeah, I, I started an NFT project in um, like during the pandemic because I was really curious about the ways that we pay artists and we pay dancers. And through an NFT structure, I wanted to find a way to continually pay a performer who might have danced for me. Because I, I always, I'm so, you know, <clears throat> like I, my, my dancers are my, without my dancers, I don't have a practice. And so I wanted to find a way that to kind of change the system, you know, to kind of find a way to, you know, through an NFT, if it gets sold, there's still a, a revenue that gets, that can, that can be pointed back to the artist or the dancer. So that was something that I, I've been doing and we, we are still doing it. Like, you know, it's, it's, it's a weird thing, you know, we, we, we made, I made it a, a drop um, and this piece was based on African masks. Um, and they, it was called Souvenir, I mean, kind of playing about this idea that the object now is in this metaverse, but you, when you would buy it, the algorithm would create it for you, so you never knew what you were gonna get, but within it, there was different attributes, and certain attributes were more valued than others, and so you kind of, it was kind of like, you know, when you're a kid and you get open up like uh, a Happy Meal and you get like the special toy. Um, so it was kind of playing on that, but the, the bigger part of the structure was that, that the dancer would get paid as, Always, there would always be some kind of funding to go back to the dancer. And I'm still thinking about this model of supporting um, performers, supporting dancers, supporting artists in a way that, you know, in the commercial art world, like a secondary market, the artist, the dancer is cut and cut out. So kind of thinking of ch changing the system. So that idea of, you know, looking inward at that system. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon. Um, almost evening, I guess. Thank you for being here. Um, this question is for uh, whomever has the answer. <laughs> um, so when we're talking about um, art lovers and artists, um, 
as we all know, a lot of artists come from, or like might start their career off with little to no money. And a lot of art lovers come from all sorts of financial spectrums. And for art lovers who are on the lower end of that spectrum, how and what suggestions do you have to be lifelong art lovers when you don't have the financial means of um, people who are on the higher end of that spectrum? Are you talking about to acquire, or are you talking yeah, about... Yeah, yeah, to acquire, even um, even attending museums. Like, I I worked um, in D.C. for a summer, um, and all the museums in D.C. are free. In other cities, fees might be 25 to $30, which may not seem like a lot for some people, but um, for others, that could be um, a, a handful. Um, so, so what suggestions do you have to be lifelong art lovers and how to continue supporting artists? Oh, thank you for that. Um, can I give it a, a first yeah. shot? Um, so uh, just so you know, um, the MCA uh, is, is, is free if you want it to be. Uh, it's free every Tuesday until 9 p.m. And it also has a range of admissions. And you can always say, no, thank you. And, and we don't make it hard. We don't, make, we don't embarrass you about it. And other museums should, frankly, operate at that level, too. But that's not my business. Um, with, regard to being, with regard to being an art lover, thank you so much. You can be a lifelong art lover. And you are, right now, in just the right place. I, am, I guarantee there are prices out there that, uh, you, can, that are, um, you can pay out on installment. You don't forget to ask. Uh, I've, I've done it. I did it when I was um, young. Uh, you know, I was like, can I buy this for like $25 a year for the next five years? And you can get a yes. And it's a print and, you know, it, it, it changes your life. Um, so start in, uh, you know, look around. Fall in love also by looking. You know, fall in love also by finding out about the artist and reading about the artist, attending their lectures, coming to the museums, and especially museums, which of course I'm totally prejudiced about. But that's because what you're going to be invited to see is, is are, are exhibitions and programs that have been so well thought through by your like kind, by your peers, you know, who are thinking with you. Um, it's a lifelong practice. Uh, and you don't necessarily have to own it, but I love that you want to. And there are ways to get there over time, you know? Like real practical, payment over time. And start with, you know, start with young artists that just hit you and, 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 and you want to believe in them. This guy started with, very, with a lot of artists that did not have na big names when he was buying them. Um, and and it will it will be a, it will be self sustaining. I hope that answers your question. And I started becoming a collector twenty plus years after I was a, a fanatic art lover. So uh, you don't have to be a collector if you're an art lover. Uh, actually, if you look at it the other way, there is so much fantastically beautiful art to love that all the money all those rich people put together could never buy. It's there, it's in, in the history of human creativity, it's in museums, it's hanging there, and it's, it's beautiful to love. Um, <clears throat> one quick thing for me is it doesn't always have to be valued through economy, through like a money system. I barter with friends. Um, a friend is an editor and would edit like an essay for a catalog for me and I would trade them work. Um, friends of mine, my collection is, are all my friends and so they live in my home with me but we always just, we trade with each other. So there's ways, other ways to do it as well. So, um, but I think the first thing is like, you know, fall in love and learn and who the artist is and you know um, and that's a, an easy way to then bring them into your life as well and there's an amazing network of Chicago galleries uh, you know there's uh, you know Jack Schneider Prairie <laughs> I have to shout him out you know like there's amazing 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 ecosystem in Chicago uh, at the ground floor hi um, I was just kind of speaking to both um, Demetrius and Brendan and, and Madeline as well because you are um, curating at the MCA. So 
what I was thinking about when you're talking about the human condition and how does it feel, and I guess this is, this is not like maybe like a collecting question, it's more, and it kind of is because as a collector, you've kind of turned into a curator in a way. How does it feel to be that catalyst and as an artist as well and curator to kind of be the essence of that human connection and condition that will go forth through history? <laughs> Sorry, deep. Always remember, I was at the uh, at the end of the process because the artists have done that already. So what I did was choose works that I thought added to one another. You take a, a Greek word for collecting is sin uh, lego, which means uh, speak with. And uh, it was my curating, or because I'm not an artist, maybe my own artistic creation, to put works together uh, that have a cohesion and a central theme and, and say something and, and go around this central issue. Now, that's not easy to do. It's not easy to succeed in that. I'm sure a lot of collectors try to have a theme, but then they get distracted and go off on other tracks. I was lucky enough to, you know, for museums to say that this is a coherent collection, you know, that's the most I can say. I just think that it's a responsibility that, you know, taking it on uh, and seeing it pass through different phases or like during, during duration, that there's a responsibility on my part to continue the work. Because also it is about making work, but it's also about making change socially and politically for me specifically. And so there's a responsibility to take on and to be aware of throughout, you know, as I make it now, but as I see it in the future as well. And I would say that we often are, we at the MCA often talk about that we're here to um, make the market not reflect it. We are here to make art history, not, not uh, follow it. And uh, as a former curator, um, uh, the, most pl the, the greatest and most, the greatest privilege is to assist an artist in catalyzing their vision. And, and I think that um, the team at the MCA would say the same. Your hand up. One last, uh, last question. <laughs> okay. Hi. Um, so I'm an artist who also teaches, and um, so I have questions for both of you. Um, I was wondering, Brendan, how your teaching practice feeds into your other facets of your practice. And um, Dimitris of Fkaristo. Um, and I was wondering, um, I, I teach in the MCA galleries, and I wondered if I can pass along any special favorites that you have in the very generous collection that we're going to be seeing soon. Uh, if you have any uh, sort of like favorite pieces. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll go first. Um, I think teaching, again, is an extension of my practice. And when I do teach, I teach research that I'm interested in that's coming out of my work. So right now I'm really interested in gardens and, and as, as social ecosystems of support and nurture and care and food. And so I'm teaching a course uh, on food and art. Um, so I work with my students in collaboration to make my research. And then afterwards I get to go into my studio and think about it in other ways. And so it really is um, uh, an intersection, again, an exchange. So I teach things that are are at, and I'm actually lucky because I get to do that at my school. My school allows me to choose like courses that are of my interest, and then I can teach with uh, with my students. So I, yeah, so I'm doing a lot of stuff with gardens and public monuments and food. So that's kind of where it is. But it is again a collaboration. I gain so much from my students, and um, I think some of them are here right now. <laughs> Do you have a favorite child? Do you have a favorite child, Dimitris? <laughs> Somebody at the MMCA today asked me, are you missing any of them? I said, all of them. <laughs> because really, yeah, you do love uh, every work that you put in your collection. Uh, even if the artist is never heard of again, uh, you know, you've, you've been moved. You've been seen something. 
But anyway, I uh, I had uh, in the past in the 2010s three museum exhibitions from my collection at the White Chapel in London in uh, Guggenheim Bilbao and in uh, the Scottish National Gallery of Modern. And despite the fact that I say that my collection has a central theme and a cohesion, I was really surprised at how uh, different and constructive the interpretations were by the curators. So I'm looking forward to yours. <laughs> Um, I think we're at time, but I want to say two things. There's a film by Brendan. What time here? Um, 3.45. 3.45. That's <coughs> happening somewhere around here, so don't miss that. You're already here. And wait. Oh, no, 4.45. 4.45. Yeah, Sorry. so <laughs> go. And, uh, and we have a teeny, teeny, teeny preview at the MCA on the second floor of two wonderful Mike Kellys that um, are from the Dimitris Daskalopoulos collection. We're still shipping them out from here and there all over the world. We thank you so many who showed up. We thank the MCA team. I see Manuel, Sam, Laura, Gina. I, I thank you for being here today. And um, thank you for caring about art. Thank you for finding ways to buy it, to see it, to fall in love with it. This is the right place. Uh, art is the lens through which you want to see the world because it'll change you and it'll change all the good things around you. So thank you for being here.